Yes, sir. Okay, so here we are. So good morning, everybody. I think after a long time, we are uh, doing a Zoom meeting. Um, the reason why I didn't do Zoom meetings in between is because uh, people were tired of them. And uh, too many Zoom meetings and uh, people started, you know, uh, hating uh, Zoom meetings. I think we can restart it. So every week I'm planning to do something uh, very special for you. And um, especially uh, I'm just starting this with a JNA, but I want to uh, um, give a lot of classes for the juniors uh, just who have joined MS or uh, doing their uh, final MS, something like that. So for the sake of postgraduates, uh, I thought we have to do something because uh, during the COVID period, many uh, postgraduates actually suffered. They um, uh, couldn't go to the um, ENT wards. So um, I'm planning to do a series of uh, webinars again for the sake of postgraduates. And I'm sure that it's going to be very useful because we're going to deal with all basic topics, like all in rhinology. So we will try to invite some very good speakers as well. Okay, without much ado, we will start with today. And uh, today's topic is uh, angiofibroma. Uh, this is something which is very close to my heart. As you know, for the past around uh, 15 years, we have been working on JNA. But uh, however much we work, I think um, we always face um, problems during surgery or after surgery. And this is one case where I want to show you, uh, even an experienced surgeon, I cannot call myself experienced, but having done around uh, you know, more than uh, 350 cases, uh, maybe near to 400 cases now, uh, even then you can, you can commit mistakes. So this is just an example to show, uh, because we generally la learn from others' mistakes. And uh, I'm very open. I can uh, you know, tell openly that uh, sometimes I do commit some mistakes. And that is how uh, we learn from others' mistakes, right? Uh, so I'm going to show you one such case, uh, which I did a few uh, weeks or maybe a month back. And uh, what is the problem which I faced during the surgery and uh, how did I rectify it? That is going to be the, uh, um, the, the topic of today's discussion. Generally, uh, when a surgeon talks, he talks only about his uh, good cases, uh, about you know, what the, uh, the best results you've got or uh, you know, the, uh, the flowery uh, results which you have. But I think uh, it's high time we talk out of our heart and talk what is actually um, the audio is not there. Uh, Dr. Bhavani says the audio is not there. Yes, sir, you can go ahead. Yeah, okay. So I think we'll have to uh, talk what is uh, what we are honestly doing and that's exactly what I'm going to do today in this lecture. It's just, uh, just one case but uh, every uh, week we will try to do uh, a series of basic cases, very basic for the sake of uh, juniors. Without much ado, we will start sh screen sharing. This is uh, my share. Share, right? This one, right? Probably. Share. And then, uh, can you see my uh, screen? Yes, sir. Okay, I first of all uh, thank Dr. Sri Harsha. Sri Harsha has been trained by me uh, for uh, nearly around 18 months. And he started a, a clinic called Sahasha Foundation Hyderabad. And uh, he's doing a lot of good work in propagating uh, knowledge. I wish him uh, the very best in his career uh, to actually uh, share his knowledge as he does also. And uh, he's a brilliant surgeon. I'm very sure about that. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Yeah, so let us get started. Juvenile nasopharyngeal angiofibroma. Uh, now it's uh, no longer called nasopharyngeal as I have been talking. Uh, it's uh, not originating from the nasopharynx in all cases. Um, most of the cases, yes. 
uh, I think uh, around 95% of the patients we've seen nasopharynx being involved, but uh, nearly 99% of the patients I've seen the pterygoid wedge being involved. And that's why we propagated the, uh, uh, the concept of an angiofibroma arising from the pterygoid wedge. Well, uh, let us discuss about this case. A 20-year-old male presented with histories of nasal block for three years. For three years. Now, a uh, patient had recurrent episodes of nasal uh, bleeding uh, stopped on itself. So, unprovoked epistaxis in a young male, adolescent male, is taken as JNA until otherwise proved. But the patient also had a left eye proptosis, massive proptosis in the left eye. And he had been previously operated twice. So, he had been operated endoscopically uh, once in 2019. And in 2020, an external approach, a Weber Ferguson was done. Well, uh, see, I'll tell you, um, uh, it's not uh, that, you know, uh, we will not commit mistakes. We, we do have uh, residues and recurrences. But I think we'll have to be very scientific in future about what we are doing. That is uh, something which is very, very important. And how, how can we definitely be scientific? I'm going to, that's what is the crux of the discussion. So the clinical examination showed a scar over the philtrum and the left nasal labial fold. Of course, the Weber Ferguson was used. Endoscopic examination showed smooth reddish vascular mass seen extending till the level of the nasal vestibule. It was actually coming right till the nasal vestibule and the patient had a massive DNS on the right side. So a mass sitting right on nasal vestibule. Okay, now, um, Many, many, many people actually um, take investigations which are actually, uh, to me, not very useful for planning a surgery. So, um, what is the investigation of choice in a JNA? So, that is one question which I would always ask myself. Will an investigation be helpful or not to me? To me, I think the only investigation of choice the most important investigation of choice, or maybe in 99% of the cases it works, will be a CECT. So maybe in 1%, um, sometimes, okay, uh, MRI works, uh, MRI, but to me, I think most of the cases I do with a contrast enhanced computerized tomogram. So let us read this uh, tomogram, uh, the uh, uh, CT scan. Uh, let us see what are the uh, informations which we can get and how we can plan the surgery. Um, so I'm going to read it cut by cut, of course. Uh, when, you, when you look at it, people generally say this. This is what people say. Involving the nasal cavity uh, and then the nasopharynx and then uh, the uh, pterygoparatine fossa and then uh, infratemporal fossa, the upper parapharyngeal space, inferior orbital fissure is here, superior orbital fissure, uh, extraconal medial part of the orbit, and then uh, pterygoid wedge and space, and the pterygoid wedge and space, and then the camera sinus uh, with an anterior uh, ext uh, anterolateral extension in the camera sinus engulfing the internal carotid artery. Well, uh, this is, I think, uh, the report which uh, radiologist gives, but I think uh, what we have to do is actually use this in such a way that we will plan the surgery. We have to plan the surgery in such a, uh, and that is what we have to do. And let's see now, this is how I usually go about it. I put it on a DICOM image and we try to plan. Of course, I'm going to put it here uh, for you uh, uh, cut by cut so we can plan. Now you see here, this is the first cut. What do you look for in the first cut? You see that the, the mass is there right in the vestibule, here right in the vestibule. And uh, if you look at it again, you see that completely filling the nasal cavity and the septum is, uh, that's the inferior turbinate. Of course, a little pixelated because uh, I have enlarged the image, uh, but you can see that the anterolateral wall has already been uh, uh, removed by the previous surgeon. And you can see that the septum is deviated towards the right side. Now, if you look at it, look at it here, uh, you can see that this is the mass uh, involving the maxillary sinus as well. 
and uh, going right down till the cheek and the, the septum is deviated towards the right side and of course the maxilla on the right side is uh, not involved and the frontal sinuses are not involved. Uh, a little bit pixelated because I have uh, increased the size but if you look at it very carefully this part of the mass is uh, enhancing uh, very high and then this medial part of the mass is not enhancing very much. So uh, we have seen this very often that um, uh, uh, there is some amount of uh, non-enhancing part of a JNA as well. So um, this is uh, something which we have uh, routinely seen in multiple revisions. So uh, in fact, there are areas where there is even fibrotic, too much of fibrosis uh, in, in the JNA when you do revisions. And uh, you can see very, very clearly in this scan, you can see here, uh, medial part is not very enhancing, the lateral part is enhancing. And that is actually the orbit, going right inside the orbit uh, through the inferior orbital fissure, involving the orbit here, pushing the, uh, um, the cone above and the optic nerve is seen there. So you can see here that the medial part of the mass is not enhancing, the lateral part is enhancing, it's going towards the uh, orbit and it's going into the infratemporal fossa and it's going right to the cheek here and then you can see that uh, this part is completely enhancing. As we go behind, it's enhancing a lot of uh, vessels. And of course, I always um, uh, say that you have to trace the vessels. So that um, uh, that will be done. You'll be seeing that very shortly. You see this um, uh, image uh, with a contrast, you will see that you can see the, the vessels uh, whitish uh, in filled with contrast. And you can actually see the vessels going right inside the, uh, uh, the tumor. So here we are, you can see that one component is there in the upper parapharyngeal space, and that's supplied by the ascending pharyngeal artery, which is here. And uh, of course, let us see the axials. You can see here, that's the ascending pharyngeal artery component. And you can see the IMAX, you see this side IMAX, very clearly you see that. Can you see the cursor, uh, Harsha? You can see the IMAX, which is uh, going anterior, uh, just behind the posterior wall of the maxilla. And here you can see the IMAX very clearly going here and also one vessel going here. And you can actually uh, plan your surgery with respect to the uh, location of the vessel. Of course, when you put it in a DICOM, it will be very, very, very clearly seen. Uh, uh, of course, I'm not, see, see the vessel going there. The posterior part, this is the ascending pharyngeal artery. And how are we going to manage this? So we do a CT angiogram. Uh, of course, uh, you can see that uh, the left internal maxillary artery, the left ascending pharyngeal artery, and also small feeders from the cavernous segment of the ICA. Uh, this is the ICA you can see here, and you can see that uh, there's a, a blood supply from the cavernous segment of the ICA. So you have both the ICA and the ECA uh, supply in this case. So uh, how do we plan this? So how do we plan this uh, case? This is gonna be the uh, billion dollar question. And uh, whether we have to do an external approach or endoscopic approach when the mass is going right till the vestibule is another question which, uh, and the patient uh, was reluctant for an external approach. He was a very smart boy. And he said, uh, sir, try your best not to give me another scar already uh, the scar was slightly uh, vanished, but I didn't want to produce another scar. So uh, I said, let me try doing it endoscopic. And if, if not, then I might go in for an external approach. So that is what I uh, got a consent for external as well as uh, uh, an endoscopic approach. Well, okay, let's actually go to the more important part of the presentation, that is the surgery. Now, as I, uh, I uh, do the surgery, I'm going to correlate it with the scan and how I plan this uh, surgery. That is what I'm going to do. So uh, the first thing you should understand in JNA surgery is I am trained as a four-handed surgeon. So I would always like to have binostral four-handed access to any vascular tumor. So I have a shilpi near me and you see that that is the septum 
which is deviated towards the right side. That's the inferior turbinate. This is the mass. You can see here, this is the mass. After a decongestion, what happens is the mass shrinks like this. But when you look at this mass, look at this. This is not looking like a typical JNA. This is not looking like a typical JNA. See, even the look of a JNA can tell you uh, uh, many things. It depends on your experience. As you get experience, you will know um, uh, how a JNA looks. Actually, some parts of the JNA can look fibrous. That even you, even that you can actually uh, look and predict. So some actually will look like a bleeding polyp. So uh, uh, it'll it'll uh, look like a collection of just blood, but it's not really vascular. Uh, uh, so we can actually differentiate all that by decongestion and uh, so uh, basically what I did was I took off a remnant septum, uh, a posterior septum already done, but anterior septum I removed, I created a binostal technique. So that is the first step I did in this because I had to have both the nostrils ready for me to attack the tumor or else I couldn't do it endoscopic. Now, what will I do? There are people who actually use the cobulation, try to cobulate, 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 cobulate. Believe me, um, uh, to me, I think that is, uh, I, I generally don't do that. I generally don't do that. Everybody has got his own technique. It's not that any particular technique is wrong or something. Uh, because to me, I think uh, um, there is one famous saying that attack uh, the difficult part of the tumor when you have the real uh, you know, strength, uh, both physically and mentally. So if you spend a lot of time in unnecessary steps, when you go to the cavernous sinus, when you're dealing with the internal carotid artery, you will be exhausted. So this is something which I learned from all my teachers. So I am fast in certain steps. So uh, Dr. D. Cruz uh, from Tata used to say this very often. Uh, a surgeon should know when to go in first gear uh, in which step he should go in fifth gear. That's the fastest. And which step to go in the first gear. So I think uh, that has a, that's got a very big impact in my career. Uh, so I plan my steps in such a way that I spend less time on steps which do not need uh, that amount of uh, importance. Now let us see that. Now I tried with the cobulation. That's the first step being done. I'm removing that remnant septum with the cobulation. And then once I do that, you can see here the middle turbinate on the right side, and you can see the superior turbinate on the right side. And that's actually uh, the mass, which is going right to the nasopharynx there. That's the eustachian tube. And then I basically we do what's called the principle of segmental resection. So uh, I tried the cobulation. I mean, uh, it was taking time. Then what I did was, see, this part is looking like a collection of blood. It's not actually the JNA. So maybe that part has been revised twice. So it's not like that. So I was just wondering what can be done. And then what I did was I used my finger. It's actually the, so basically uh, there is nothing which is actually, um, you know, uh, specific to any surgery. You have to do this. You have, so you see, it's very unconventional, but then it helped me because uh, if I had used the diathermy or cobulation, it would have taken me at least one and a half hours to do that. So what I did was I used my finger, I took off a massive part of that non-enhancing JNA. So you see that once I did that, this part, which is really enhancing, uh, could be actually visualized. So this can be done endoscopic. Uh, very, very easily. And then what you do is you see here, now I'm going to plan my surgery. So uh, the first, so what I will do now, I'm going to show you what I did. So with the scan. So I removed this part of the surgery, uh, part of the JNA, which is actually the anterior part and which is less vascular. And second is I have to go in for the intratemporal fossa part. So um, it's a principle of segmental resection, right? I have to look at the IMAX second because uh, I have not embolized this case. I have not done anything. So I have to uh, uh, ligate the uh, um, internal maxillary artery. So for that, I have to go into the intratemporal fossa. But already the anatomy is so distorted. How will you, because the, uh, it's going into the maxillary sinus, it's going into the cheek. 
So how do I plan? So I am telling you, uh, my dear friends, the best way to plan is with the help of the bones, not with an MRI. In an MRI, you cannot plan a surgery. Please understand, you cannot plan a surgery. Extra cranial tumor with, uh, even for example, if you want uh, to do a pituitary or a meningioma, the bony landmarks are very important before you enter into the dura. After the dura, <clears throat> then you use the MRI. So outside the dura, I think it's all about the bone. So here we are. The first thing I would like to see is this bone. See here. So that uh, forms the inferior wall of the, uh, uh, of the orbit, which I use for planning. So I will be delineating this. See that? This delineating this. If I go behind, that, that's one cut before. You see, there's no anterolateral wall at all of the maxilla. There's no anterolateral wall. This is the... Uh, uh, tumor and you can see here there's a small vessel here and when you go behind you can see that the the lateral most part of, that is a posterior lateral the junction of the posterior wall and the lateral wall has not been removed by the previous surgeon and you can see here that this is actually the tumor which is prolapsing there you see here this this bone so this bone has to be removed if i have to take this component out so basically, JNA surgery is all about uh, removing the, uh, the, the bottlenecks. So removing the bottlenecks. You see that behind that posterior wall of the maxilla, you see the huge tumor. So how do you approach it? You can approach it only, I'm uh, shuttling between to and fro between the films. You see, only if I remove this bone, I can go and see the posterior bone, right? So people who uh, have been doing JNA can understand what I'm talking. So, but how do I find this bone? How do I find this bone? Because the, the, um, the JNA is sitting in front. I have to follow this. So my plan would be now to cobble and get this bone. So this is my next step. This is my next step. I will try to get this bone and then I will go and try to get the anterolateral, remnant anterolateral wall and the junction between the posterior and the lateral wall. Now let us see uh, whether I have done that in this step. Let us see that. So I got that and then now I uh, have, uh, okay, now you see here. Now I have used my hand. That is the, uh, ah, now I'm getting that bone. See, see exactly how I'm planning. So I'm getting that bone, which is the floor of the orbit. And then I will just swipe it laterally to get that bone, which is actually See that now I'm now it's going inside the orbit now. Here it's going inside the orbit. And you see that I've got that bone, which is the posterior wall of the maxilla. And now I'm drilling that inferior wall of the orbit. See that this is very, very important. Planning the surgery is, I think, the key to uh, any surgery for that matter, any surgery, whether it's mastoid, uh, whatever. So I think the planning, you should have a clear plan in your mind before you attack any surgery. So this is the periorbita. I have now uh, taken off that bone from the floor of the orbit because only if I take this bone, I can reach posteriorly. Now that is the remnant of the lateral wall of the uh, maxilla and the junction of the lateral and the posterior wall. That's, that bone is very thick. As you saw in the scan, that bone is very, very, very thick. See here, I'm now taking it off. See that it's a posterior wall which has not been removed and I have to remove that in case I want to get that tumor which is prolapsing into the cheek. So you see that. So this is my second part of the surgery. So getting that bone out. This is what is called planning. So you have to plan. That cannot be done with an MRI. How can you plan a bone removal with an MRI? So I don't think MRI is a meaningful investigation for a JNA, especially extracranial part. Of course, when you're going intracranial, that's a different, totally different ball game. Now I'm removing the junction of the posterior and, and, the, lat uh, and the lateral wall of the, uh, anterolateral wall of the maxilla. Now, once I do that, you can see the periosteum there. The JNA is of course seen very clearly there. And I'm now trying to uh, remove the uh, bone. And then what you do, you do packing. You just do the packing. You just do the packing. See, I'll tell you what. Um, Many, many people want to identify the IMAX. Sometimes the tumor is so big that it's difficult for you to identify the IMAX. 
of course the imax is going to come either laterally or posteriorly so what i usually do what the, what is the trick i use so that's a tumor so you keep on packing in a plane between the temporalis muscle and this tumor you keep on packing so what will happen with that pack is that it will create a tamponade so you don't have so sometimes you can't even see the imax uh, it's very difficult so um, i mean if you are an expert they, yes but if you are a beginner it's difficult so what i always advise is keep a lot of packs lateral to the jna between the um, uh, the mandible that's called the pterygo mandibular uh, space and you try to pack it so tightly that that will cause a tamponade of that vessel so this is a trick which i want to tell you so once you create a tamponade what happens is that the imax is something like you know it has been occluded uh, by a, a roller gauze so that is how i go about it so once i do that i'm going to again go back to the video so um i'm just going to 3.01 so it's all about the planning which i'm discussing in this uh, 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 surgery uh, don't uh, uh, mistake me for back, uh, forwarding and uh, rewinding and things like that now what i'm trying to do is you see here that's the nasal part so what i have to do is i have to segmentally resect the nasal part uh, before i push that so imagine that i have a nasal part here you have the nasal part here how can you push the infratemporal fossa part medially unless i resect this part i cannot push that part medially so my plan would be to resect the nasal part of the tumor and how do i do that when there is bleeding so that's why i packed it so once i pack it so tightly i have occluded most of the vessels and then i go in for the uh, what is called the pushing up technique this i have described in my book and then rolling up and the rolling down technique once i do that the nasal part of the tumor comes out so this is my uh, second plan the uh, second uh, plan of execu execution that is the first was with a finger i took off the non vascular part the second was i occluded the imax and i removed the uh, nasal part now what will be my next step what will be my next step my next step you see if i want to identify the infratemporal fossa part uh, completely then i should get an anatomy of the sphenoid sinus so i have to be careful about the carotid artery i have to be careful about the uh, uh, i have to be careful about the uh, uh, the optic nerve so see here so again i go to the scan back and i plan so here we are that is the posterior ethmoid on the right side which is free you can see here and you can see here that's the posterior ethmoid on the right side and i have to now the sphenoid part has already come out right so uh, by the roll up roll, rolling down technique so i have to get this anatomy this anatomy so of course in the in this part it's going into the cavernous sinus other parts along i have to get the skull base and the anatomy so i'm trying now to get the anatomy of the sphenoid sinus so that it will help me in identifying the uh, uh, structures in the uh, in, with relationship to the uh, uh, sphenoid sinus now let us go and see what i have done right now that is the uh, uh, now i'm going now and uh, now you see here now i'm going and identifying the uh, anatomy of the posterior ethmoid on the right side because i know that the posterior ethmoid on the right side is free see here that's the posterior ethmoid on the right side so i am planning with the bone see again with the bone that's a posterior ethmoid on the right side i am trying to get the planum i want to get the planum i want to get the optics so that i have an anatomy now now i have defined the anatomy of the sphenoid sinus i am getting the cella i am getting the cella i am getting the optics i am getting the carotids and here because if i have to do the cavernous sinus i have to get the carotid on the opposite side or else it's very dangerous for me to operate Uh, without knowledge of the anatomy how do you know whether it's a carotid or not only by comparison you will know only by so get the normal anatomy first so uh, this is very very important my dear junior friends you should know that get your anatomy from the normal side compare it with the abnormal side so here we are i'm getting the anatomy of the carotid artery you can see here a mass just in the inferior part of the uh, sphenoid sinus 
now what i'm trying to do is i'm now trying to uh, just drill over the maxillary strut always always again and again i say that if you have to remove the tumor from any crevice you have to release it from the bone so that's a maxillary strut so you all know what's the definition of the maxillary strut it is just anterior inferior to the superior orbital fissure so here we are because the tumor is involving superior orbital fissure now i'm now trying to release the bone and and expose the carotid artery so i'm trying to expose the carotid artery because we have feeders from both the carotid and external carotid and the internal carotid you see here i'm now trying to drill around that the cella i'm getting the cavernous carotid i'm trying to drill along the cavernous carotid because the tumor is going in the anterolateral compartment of the cavernous sinus this is very very important which compartment of the cavernous sinus is involved you should be able to map the tumor with respect to the compartment of the cavernous sinus there are four compartments of the cavernous sinus as you know and now i am trying to drill over the carotid artery and to release the carotid so that i can transpose the carotid medially so this is very very important you see here so that's a cella getting the cavernous carotid of course people who are doing skull base can recognize what i'm trying to do if you are not acquainted with skull base it's a little difficult because uh, it's very difficult for you to identify what i'm trying to do now this is actually the cella and along the lateral aspect of the cella will come the cavernous carotid so i am now trying to um, then will come the clinoidal carotid i have nothing to do with the clinoidal carotid in this case because the cavernous sinus is involved anterior inferior compartment is involved i am now trying to get the uh, see the carotid now now i will use my doppler i will use my doppler to check whether that's the carotid see here now what i have done is to drill that little bit of the maxillary strut and get that uh, carotid completely uh, free so that i can release the cavernous sinus so this is what i'm trying to do i am now trying to take off the bone medial to the carotid now that's the doppler of course i am not put in sound to uh, not to scare you but that is the doppler i am now checking whether that's the carotid artery and yes that's the carotid artery and now i'm very happy i am now trying to release the inferior part of that carotid canal so always always try to drill off and then what happens is that once i've drilled off i have a little bit of remnant in the inferior part of the sphenoid sinus which i am doing what is called the rolling up technique of course those of you who have uh, not got acquainted with this please read my book the rolling up and the rolling down technique are very 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 useful in clearing the nasopharyngeal part and the sphenoid part of a jna so once i have removed that now again i am doing uh, see here that's the v2 that's the v2 of course um uh this is the v2 it's it's definitely a non embolized jna which is getting feeders from all over so there will be a little bled don't worry about that that's the pterygoid bed see that venous bleeding if you have along so i'm drilling the bone inferior to the v2 anterior so i don't want the v2 so i'm going to cut it because i'm anyway going to cut it in the orbit because the orbit is completely involved so that's a pterygoid bed and once i do that i'm now trying to take off the tumor from the bed and identify the vdn now the most important thing is to get the vdn so that i have a, a clear anatomy of the carotid artery so these are things which you have to plan during surgery and that is very important that you get uh, see that now i am removing that from actually the pterygoid wedge and i'm now that's a uh, vdn canal i'm trying to drill that vdn canal to get the anatomy of the vdn to get the complete uh anatomy of the carotid see that that's the paraclival carotid which i'm trying to uh, delineate so basically try whenever you're dealing with uh, jna involving the carotid try to completely uncap the carotid so that in any case if you have any bleeding or something like that then what you can do wait now i will stop here uh, in case you have a bleeding then what you can do is you can actually go in for either uh uh a uh, proximal control of the carotid now what have i done so here we are now what i've done here is i've gone posteriorly i've removed the inferior part of the uh, uh, of the jna here that's the inferior part here i've removed that jna of course this part has not yet come that's the uh, pterygoid wedge which i've drilled a little here and then <clears throat> now i am ready for my infratemporal fossa part because i've removed 
the whole of the nasal part. So I can roll this inside. I can roll this infratemporal fossa part inside. So that's what I'm going to do right now. So what is the instrument I use? I generally use a, a, a cat's paw or a free ears uh, because that to me is the best instrument. I don't use the cobulation uh, generally in a JNA. As you know, I've been uh, uh, shouting about it for years. Don't use too much of the cobulation because you will uh, lose track of the, uh, of the uh, uh, color. Uh, that's very important. Play of colors is very, very important whenever you do. Ah, now you see here, what I'm doing now is once I've got that uh, carotid under control, now I'm pushing the uh, infratemporal fossa part. See that now. I'm pushing the infratemporal fossa part. See that gauze piece which is actually there. I am now I'm identifying the IMAX, clipping it there. So I know exactly where the IMAX is. That's how I can clip it. And once I clip it, I cut it and then I remove that. That you can see the lateral pterygoid muscle. And of course, a little bit of JNA is left behind along the orbit. Now that's actually the J, uh, uh, branches from the IMAX. I have, that's a fact of the infratemporal uh, fossa. Okay, now having done that, uh, now it's 824. That is, I mean the, uh, um, okay, video, 824. Now, let us see what we have done from the beginning. The nasal part has been removed. The nasal part has been removed uh, with the hand and then the, um, uh, this part in the uh, the maxilla and uh, infratemporal fossa has also been removed. Uh, the part in the uh, nasopharynx has been removed. The part in the sphenoid sinus has been removed. And what is left behind? Now, let us go through again. What is left behind is the part in the orbit. See here, this is the orbit. So this, part, I have, so this is basically a principle of um, segmental resection. So we have segmentally resected one, the nasal part, the floor of the sphenoid part, the infratemporal fossa part, the cheek part. Now what is left behind is intraorbital part. You see the orbit completely, uh, the orbital part is here and the inferior orbital fissure, superior orbital fissure part, and then going towards the cavernous sinus part. And of course, here is the pterygoid fossa part. And of course, in the upper parapharyngeal space. So this is what is left behind. Now let us go and see the video again. So uh, you now have a clear idea of what all the things we have removed and what we have to remove. Now let us go and see here. Now that's the infratemporal fossa part. Now we are dissecting the orbital part. See, now I use a principle of traction, counter traction for the orbital part, gently uh, push the orbital fat up. Of course, we have cut the V2. Uh, this will anyway get cut because uh, it's going to the superior orbital fissure and then the cavernous sinus. There are some structures we may not be able to preserve, especially when you have such a big JNA. Uh, and you see here, I'm now going towards the orbital part and I'm now dissecting the tumor from the orbit. So all these with the bony landmarks, which I have created. And now again, I am segmentally resecting the part. So please understand, my dear friends, when you are doing a tumor in the cavernous sinus, don't keep a large part of the tumor and operate. Because when you have maybe a carotid bleed or something like that, you should be able to uh, see the carotid very clearly and you should have only very less part of the tumor. So you try to reduce the tumor to the smallest size possible. So that is what is called. So the orbital part, inferior orbital fissure part has come out. So you see that now I'm transecting it. So everything with the scissors. So because now I'm now going for the superior orbital fissure part. That's the superior orbital. And believe me, it, it basically when you're dealing with the cavernous sinus, it depends upon which compartment of the cavernous sinus is involved. If the anterolateral part of the cavernous sinus is involved, the best method of dissecting it is a gentle pull. If it is going to be the medial part, of course, we have a different technique. Every, everything is uh, uh, um, based on which compartment of the cavernous sinus is involved. So I'm giving what is called a gentle pull in the superior, that's a superior orbital fissure. And remember that all the, uh, so all the cranial nerves will be shifted laterally. I'm using the carotid now, that's a carotid Doppler just to check uh, where this tumor is in relationship with the carotid. You can see here. And uh, um, 
as you saw in the angiogram, there were a little feeders from the uh, uh, carotid. Don't worry about them because the feeders are very small. Basically, it will stop uh, uh, with just a surgery cell. If you see that, now you can see here that the tumor is being gently removed from the cavernous sinus. You can see the cavernous bleed very clearly. See that, see that. I'm using four-handed technique, a gentle traction technique. And that is a tumor from the cavernous sinus, which is coming out very beautifully seen. So now you can see the darkish blood from the cavernous sinus. The anter this is basically the anteroinferior compartment of the uh, cavernous sinus. So this is uh, very clear going. Now you can see here, I'm going to use my Doppler and I'm checking whether I have gone till the carotid. Yes, I've gone till the carotid. I can see that. Uh, and now I pack it. So don't worry about the cavernous sinus. You can just pack it with surgery cell. It'll just stop. So that's it. So we have removed the cavernous sinus, superior orbital fissure, inferior orbital fissure part. See, that's the infratemporal fossa part. Now, the final would be to look at the pterygoid wedge. Of course, now I'm just inspecting the infratemporal fossa uh, just to see if there is it. That's a lateral pterygoid plate. Uh, so what happened was I'm trying my best to locate if I have left behind any residue. See, this is where it is very useful when you don't use the coblation. When you use the coblation, this muscle will turn white. The fat will turn white. So you will not have a play of colors. You see here, this is yellow color. This is a, a, a sort of, you know, a muzzle color. And you have the surgery cell. You have the nerve, which is whitish in color. All that will turn white when you use the coblation. Now I'm inspecting, that's the temporalis, the te lateral pterygoid, the infratemporal fat, I'm using that. Of course, uh, Professor Karao has uh, published a paper where uh, the fat can be used for reconstruction. You can go through his recent article, surgery cell in the cavernous sinus. This is the final view of the cavity. I was very, very, very sure that I removed the tumor completely because I have removed part by part. I studied the scan. I removed the nasal part. I removed. So we had around uh, uh, 700 ml of blood loss, 700 ml of blood loss. Of course, we transfused uh, um, one or two pints of uh, blood, uh, but the patient was uh, completely uh, all right. On the next day, the proptosis came down and... Uh, and what happened was basically, uh, this is the idea of the presentation. So in all skull-based cases, people show surgeries, uh, beautiful surgeries, but they don't show the post-operative scan. So if, and all the cuts of the scan, some people show just one cut and there might be a residual in another cut. So you never know. So I think that is where your honesty comes in. And this is where uh, we did the repeat scan on the post-operative third day. Now, let us study this scan. See here, I've removed that part of the septum. You can see here that we have removed the, uh, the, the maxillary component. We have removed the uh, cheek component. You can see the cheek component come out. That's the orbital component, uh, which has completely come out. The superior orbital fissure component, which has come out. The cavernous sinus beautifully come out. See the release of the bone. See that amount of bone has been released for this. All that has come out. That's a carotid artery. Very beautifully hanging carotid there. But what I found was there was a residue in the upper parapharyngeal space. You can see here. That's the upper parapharyngeal space and there was a residue. Now, how do I uh, tell this to the patient? I think this is where honesty comes in. You have to tell him that you have a residual tumor and I will go and reoperate on this tumor. So we, are, if the patient has got, has got a residue which you have left behind on the carotid and you feel that it's not possible, that's a different question. You tell the patient, yes, I've left behind. But when you say that you removed it completely and then take a scan and see that you have a residue, I think it's your duty mandatory that when the patient goes out of your hospital, he should be rid of tumor. So I'm basically very honest with my patient. And you can see that the ascending pharyngeal is there, uh, which is supplying that part of the parapharyngeal, upper parapharyngeal space. You can see here, uh, that is the uh, component which is... Now, how do we plan this surgery? Very, very simple. You see here, this is the lateral pterygoid plate. So if you drill this lateral pterygoid plate, then this component can be pushed medium. So this is the idea with which I said, okay. So we did the re-revision surgery, which was done on 3-2. 
and the residual removed without any blood loss. Of course, there was a little uh, bleeder, which I'm going to show you from the ascending pharyngeal, and you're going to see that uh, revision residual surgery uh, done by us uh, on the uh, fourth day. Now, this is how it looked, the cavity looked on the fourth day. And what I have to do is straightforward. Now, you plan it with the bone. If you had taken an MRI, you cannot plan the surgery. Again, I'm telling you, don't take MRIs for extracranial tumors. There is no use of an MRI. See, that's the ascending pharyngeal artery. I'm trying to clip that ascending pharyngeal artery. You can see that very, very clearly. I will use my clip and I will clip that ascending pharyngeal artery. So all these are very important lessons you have to learn. I'm just, again, doing what's called a tamponade. So basically, try to use tamponades. These are very, very important tools for you. See, that's the tumor which I feel, and you have to use a tamponade lateral to the tumor. So, uh, so that when you, even if you're drilling, uh, uh, and if it hits the tumor, it's not going to bleed because you use tumor tamponade uh, with a gauze piece. Now I can see the tumor there very, very beautifully. I've uh, released the lateral pterygoid um, uh, plate and see that tumor coming out. It was not seen in the first surgery because I didn't search for it. I agree. And now you can see that that's beautifully coming out, so beautifully. And you have that vessel, the ascending pharyngeal, very beautifully seen. I'm going to now put that clip over the ascending pharyngeal, which was coming from below upwards. So imagine that uh, I would not have been able to clip that in, I mean, in the first surgery if I had just, I mean, so that's the that's clip which is going and that's it. So, um, so that tumor tamponade helped me and now I'm going to pack it with gel foam. And, uh, and the same thing, imagine if I had left behind on the carotid wantonly, it's a different issue. Suppose I had, uh, the patient had not given consent for uh, a high risk or something like that, then I would not venture on to doing carotid work. So it depends on how much uh, consent the patient also gives. So you can see the orbit there above, you can see that this tumor has been completely removed. And of course, um, then of course uh, plan, uh, so the conclusion of this presentation is what mistake? Uh, I left behind a small residue in the parapharyngeal, upper parapharyngeal space, and I realized it and I removed it. That's the most important crux of this presentation. So plan a surgery very clearly with a CECT. Don't plan it with an MRI. Plan with respect to bony landmarks. Don't plan with respect to soft tissue landmarks. Do a post-operative CECT. Always, always in an extracranial tumor. Now go ahead if there is a residue and if you can manage it or else you know you can't uh, uh, be heroic and go about it. So this is why I actually presented this. Wanted to show you that uh, well, uh, if you want to get a complete um, good result. So uh, imagine that the first two surgeons had done this. They had done a, a, a post-operative CECT. Then the patient would not come to me uh, the third time. Imagine. So I think this is where our honesty should come in. Our uh, ability to accept what, um, what is the best for the patient should come in. And uh, I think everybody in the world should, uh, I think, uh, do a post-operative MRI or a CT. If it is intracranial MRI, if it's extracranial uh, CT, uh, don't postpone it for three months or six months and say that, no, no, the tumor has grown by itself. People generally say, no, you know what? Uh, what I removed was perfect, but now the tumor has grown suddenly. So this is something which uh, I think... Uh, uh, I think we should learn as uh, good skull-based surgeons. So I end my presentation here and I, uh, I think I see some very, very eminent people here. Dr. Sethi is here. Uh, he is my teacher. And uh, today I am what I am because of him. And there is no second question. I would like uh, to have the comments from Dr. Sethi if uh, he is present uh, on a Sunday morning. I would love to listen to him first. Uh, Professor Sethi, are you there? Professor Sethi, Arsha. Sir, I've asked uh, to unmute, sir. It's always a pleasure to watch uh, Professor Sethi uh, anytime. Uh, and uh, 
I'm always inspired by him. Uh, I'm not sure if he's uh, in front of his computer. Let's see if he can join us, bless us. So I think we had a very interesting uh, case where I think um, we formed a little protocols uh, how to go about an extracranial vascular tumor. And uh, if it's going through the nasal cavity, it's not necessary that you have to go for an external approach. It's not necessary. It depends upon uh, your expertise. Of course, the approach doesn't matter. You can go anyway. But the ultimate aim is to remove the tumor completely. This is what uh, is the carry-on message. Uh, don't think that, you know, I'm against an external approach. It's not so. Uh, you can do a maxillary swing, whatever you want you to do. But the thing is, take a post-operative MRI and show the patient that you have removed the tumor completely. I think Professor Seti is not there. Now you can open up the uh, um, the the hall for uh, discussion. Anybody who wants to talk can actually unmute and uh, talk. Harsha, you can manage it. Yes, sir. Hi, Dr. Janki. Hi, Dr. Prakash Mukha, sir. It's uh, always an inspiration on a Sunday. Thank you so much for being there. Always like a brother, mentor. Thank you, sir. It was an excellent presentation. There were certain points uh, which are very important you explained. Uh, number one is stepwise. First, you read your CT nicely. Then you plan it stepwise. And as we mostly tend to take out the whole mass in totality, probably this approach, what you said, is a segmental resection. No. Something will go a long way. And what is most important is the post-op CT, review CT. Because we have discussed nth time for JNA, it is not the recurrence, which, but it is 99% is the residual mass. And how to avoid get a uh, post-op iskagram, a post-op CT, and see for yourself whether something is left or not. There remains a great deal of doubt in the mind of most of the surgeon when to go for what is the best time to go for a repeat CT. Yeah, so uh, that's a very good question by Dr. Prakash Munka. Always he asks the best questions actually. Uh, uh, there are two important points in this. Should we go in for an MRI or should we go in for a CT? This is something that is very, very important. See, uh, I always believe that uh, if you do an MRI, if you do an MRI uh, after a particular period of time, maybe three months or six months, fibrosis also enhances. I've written that very clearly in the book. In my book, I have written surveillance should not be done with an MRI in a JNA. Very, very important. I've seen several people posting MRIs post-op. You can do that post-op for maybe three weeks, but not after that. Even that cannot be used for planning. So uh, I understand that there is a certain amount of radiation exposure uh, with a post-op CT, but then uh, you don't want the patient to undergo another surgery, right? So uh, um, instead of taking a CT, uh, I mean, uh, you have to balance it, which is better, <laughs> taking a CT with a little radiation or going for a, a completely uh, another surgery. So I think, uh, I always believe that take a repeat CT on the seventh day. Seventh day, uh, in our center, we take it on the third or fourth day uh, because uh, I the patients are all coming from uh, various other places. I cannot make the patient wait for uh, ages together. He wants to go home. So a uh, third day I take it, I operate on the fourth day and then again, the seventh day, the patient is discharged. So, but I, I honestly believe that seven days, uh, C, for CECT, there is no problem at all. From the third day, any day you can take. Uh, because only an MRI, uh, you can wait for seven days because surgery cell, all that packing yeah. material can, uh, you know, uh, cause some distortion. But for a CECT, the tumor will clearly enhance. The tumor will clearly enhance from the uh, next day itself you can say, take, but third day is the ideal day for taking a CECT. And again and again, I say MRI can be taken, but cannot be used for planning. It's very important. So, so we conclude that it should be done on either third or fourth day. Uh, and this is always CECT preferred over any other modality. 
Absolutely. There is no question, second question about it. And you support have to do a contrast enhanced computerized tomography. When you find a small enhancement, uh, are you sure that it is the residual growth or maybe it is some of the blood which has collected, vessel is leaking and so is the dye? And will you like to wait, repeat or go for the surgery? There is, uh, blood doesn't enhance. Number one, blood doesn't enhance. Number two, uh, uh, you have to compare it with the previous scan. Right. And you will see a beautiful contour also. You can see the contour of, uh, of the uh, JNA right there. If you look at my presentation, you can see the uh, upper parapharyngeal space yeah. exactly there and here. So yeah. uh, uh, no other structure enhances. Even uh, artery will not have a sort of a rounded uh, appearance. So a uh, blood doesn't enhance. Okay. So the thing is, you have to, uh, I mean, the ooze out uh, clotted bread doesn't enhance. So um, you can compare it to the previous scan and the, the, if you have a decently good radiologist, he will, he will come in. There is a residue. Okay. So now, the third thing, now the third thing, which is most important, is the timing to re-explore and how you convince the patient that something might have left. Because once you have finished your surgery, you are very much sure that you have taken out most of the part of the growth. So number one is how to convince to redo and ideal time to read to. Yeah, number one is whenever you uh, you, you counsel a patient uh, for a uh, for a massive vascular tumor, you always I always get a consent for stage procedure. Yeah. So, um, I always tell him that if uh, I'm not able to do it because of blood loss or uh, mm -hmm. uh, because the anesthesia, anesthetist says that you have to stop, then I might go in for a staging of the procedure. And the staging will be done after hemodynamically, the patient is stable and the anesthetist says okay. So, this is a consent which I get for all patients. Any skull based patient. There is no embarrassment to tell the patient that we are going to do it again. That is very important part. So you are telling the patient that I am going to stage it. Yes. Because most of the people, even in spite of they say small mass, in whatever they can think that we can pass it on and then we can blame something like a recurrence. That is very important point number one. Number two, when to go for surgery. Immediately, any, any harm or advantage waiting it. The uh, timing of surgery completely depends on our anesthetist. So the patient should be hemodynamically stable. If the patient is stable, the anesthetist is able to manage the volume uh, replacements and uh, the electrolytes imbalance and things like that. Then for us, there is no problem. Uh, you can just go ahead. But it depends on where the residue is also. Yes. Suppose the patient has got a residue on the carotid artery. Mm -hmm. And uh, on the cavernous, inside the cavernous sinus. First of all, you should understand that are you competent enough to go and uh, deal with that uh, residue? Mm -hmm. So there is no point in saying, no, no, I will go and deal with it and cut the carotid. So yeah. uh, uh, then, you know, then I always say uh, the, the enemy of good is better. The enemy of good is better. At least you could have uh, sent the patient home alive instead of uh, uh, killing the patient. So uh, don't uh, send a, a morbid, you should not create a morbidity. So it has to be weighed against morbidity, mortality versus your surgical expertise and the a place of recurrence, a right. place of residue. So all that has to be balanced. Suppose there is a residue in the cavernous sinus uh, and you have left it behind accidentally and you know that if you pluck it, the sixth nerve is going to be, get paralyzed. Yeah. Imagine. Then I would say no. I would I would say, boss, see if I do it, your sixth nerve will go. You'll have diplopia. I would not do it. So it depends on how much of morbidity you will create when you do a recurrent surgery. Also, this is very important because nowadays we are moving towards functional surgery. Functional right. surgery means try to preserve function as possible, as much as possible, even though you leave behind a little residue. Don't uh, fight with that residue if the function is going to be altered. This is very important. Well, uh, just last point, like in this case, where we could find a residue which can be removed sooner the better, before the fibrosis sets up. Yes, right. correct. So because uh, I, exact, uh, the, 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 the place is raw and yeah. you can easily push it, there is no fibrosis, it's a virgin uh, space, you've already created the space. So why not? I mean, you can just go ahead, 
you know exactly you have planted to the bone lateral pterygoid just drill it uh, ascending pharyngeal artery is the uh, supply just uh, do a, a tamponade tumor tamponade and remove it that's all finish so in so waiting for 3 months if you have waited for 3 months this patient is going to have a fibrosis and it will grow also the 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 tumor is going to grow and uh, i mean there are people who put the patient on flutamide uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, tablet flutamide or uh, uh, you know radiotherapy i don't believe in all those in the hope I, that it will uh, recede no no you say couple of take home messages number one is staging segmental resection and most important is the consent for a staging once you find a recurrence if i just conclude you once you find a recurrence you should check your ability your setup residue you not recurrence depending on that whether you should go for it or not and if at all you are competent to go for it you should be done sooner the better am i right perfect very good summary thank you excellent sir. excellent okay hello janki can you hear me yeah uh... Oh, sir, Professor uh, Sethi, sir, uh, how are you? I can't see. Very nice, very nice to uh, you know hear you, and excellent presentation. I was here, but there was a problem with my mic. I just resolved oh. it, okay. and I was here uh, listening to you throughout. Thank so you. excellent presentation. You made my day, and uh, as usual, you know, learned a couple of things from you. And uh, oh. uh, Dr. Munka asked all the right questions. So interesting uh, uh, discussion as well. Uh, just one one question here. The residual tumor was, I think, easily accessible. You know, the, you went in; it was uh, identified it on the CT scan. But what if it was left in near the carotid artery or in the superior orbital fissure in an area which is more complex? Uh, would you deal with it any differently? Yeah, that's a fantastic question. Uh, as I told, uh, it depends upon uh, uh, number one is the surgeon's uh, expertise. Number two is uh, the morbidity, mortality versus tumor removal, and um, uh, uh, of course, as you say, the location. The most important thing is the location, and if it's going to be uh, in a place where you feel that you are going to create more problems, then it's better not to do it. It's better right. to. Uh, but honestly speaking, I wouldn't advise radiotherapy for a benign tumor. I wouldn't uh, advise to, you know, uh, see if it grows. Uh, I have to uh, then monitor this patient regularly, uh, ask him to come for follow-up and see if it grows. And if it grows, uh, I think it's better we refer him to a center where it can be done. So there are so many centers around the world. And yeah. you can, uh, refer. I think that, that, that should be the, I don't know, uh, maybe you can tell me about that. No, actually, the first case I did was in 1998. I still like I never forget that case. It was a young man, uh, Indonesian, but he had gone to Australia to get an opinion on his tumor, and uh, he was actually on his way to London to have the surgery there and stop by in Singapore. Anyway, I did it for him endoscopically, but I left behind a small peanut-sized uh, tumor uh, very near the uh, internal carotid artery, and uh, at that time, not actually, it was not. Yeah, very close. Just uh, you know, anterior to it, maybe near the um, uh, the maxillary strut, as you call it, in that particular area. And at that time, we had just started off, so we didn't have too, a lot of experience in dealing with those areas. So I I gave him radiotherapy. I, you know, after discussing it with the the um, uh, uh, surgeons and uh, the radiologist and radiotherapist, we gave him a course of radiotherapy. And till today, I mean, I see him almost. Uh, he used to come every year. But because of the pandemic, I haven't seen him in the last three years or so. It has remained the same. It has not grown or anything. It's still there, but it is still the size of a small, you know, very small little peanut. So I think at this time and age, we have learned a lot after 25 years or so. We have learned a lot about uh, from your presentation, from experiences of others, that um, it is best to remove it and not subject to the patient of the side effects of radiation and all. So the most appropriate thing to do currently would be, of course, to remove it. And of course, that also depends. If you are a good experienced surgeon, you may not leave anything behind. But sometimes that happens even to the best of surgeons that you can inadvertently leave something behind thinking that you have removed it completely. And I like your um, you know, protocol of doing the uh, CT scan within 372 hours or so. Uh, we usually do it about 24, 48 hours, about there. But I think it doesn't really matter whether it's uh, you know, 48 or um, 372 hours. But the important thing is the patient should go back uh, with the tumor completely removed, and that is uh, our key uh, outcome measure, you know, in such cases. 
So congratulations again. I am really proud, proud of you, the kind of work you are doing and have done. Very nice. Thank you so much. Dr. Sethi, sir. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, good morning, sir. I'm Dr. Munka. Prakash. Yes, Munka. I know you very well, sir. Thank you, sir. <laughs> Just one thing. As you said, if there is a small mass, you do watch that and do a serial CT at an interval of three months. So yeah. now what are the indications? Like you explained a case where it was hardly increasing. You just keep a watch on it and you can wait for it. And you have given radiotherapy. Otherwise, yeah. as radiotherapy is nowadays, most of the places it is contraindicated. Exactly. What is the Absolutely. criteria when you should go and redo it? Or Absolutely. wait for how long? Residual mass increasing very insidiously. No, well, no, you know, see, I, basically, I, I, I think uh, as Dr. Sethi says, uh, we can actually follow up this patient and see if it is increasing or not, increasing in size or not. Am I right, Professor Sethi? Yes, that's correct. That's correct. It really depends on the location also. Like in this case, it was easily removed, easily accessible. But sometimes, you know, the, the surgeon may not be as experienced as you are and he has left behind a tumor there and he doesn't have the expertise uh, to remove it or even to send it uh, for that matter to someone. I mean, there are people all over the world who may be in that kind of situation. So in that case, it may be prudent to just leave it there and observe it, uh, do a serial CT scans every three months or six months or so and see whether it's growing or not. What do you I think, think about uh, that? In that case, I think uh, tablet flutamide, uh, which has been tried, and I think uh, that would be useful. Uh, and also, there are some papers which always, always also say about spontaneous regression. Right. So, uh, uh, for that, I always believe that I have left behind a few tumors when I, were, uh, when I started my career. And right. I was uh, very particular in seeing whether that particular tumor had any blood vessel uh, which was supplying it. Exactly. For example, this, this patient had an acidic pharyngeal artery which was like a, a, like a, like a well, lollipop. Feed so, it. I knew that this is going to grow. Yeah. Uh, but if you feel that the, it's almost an, an area which is completely uh, avascularized by all the vessels which you have ligated, then I think a wait and watch policy, uh, a spontaneous regression, tablet flutamide, tablet, I mean, then finally radiotherapy, all these are options. Am I right, Professor Sethi? Yeah. Yes, absolutely correct. Absolutely. Absolutely. The other thing is that I think I saw your CT scan surgical planning was excellent. Uh, but I think for juniors, it may be a good idea to show them on the DICOM viewer because the image quality is much better. Not only uh, all the landmark areas like the superior orbital fissure, the inferior orbital fissure, where the inferior temporal fossa starts, where it ends, and uh, the, you know, all the anatomy uh, on the normal side so that they can appreciate what is that normal side. And also uh, show them how to identify all the um, arteries for that matter, all the branches of the external carotid artery. And I think you have a very brilliant presentation on that. Uh, I've seen you uh, doing that very brilliant presentation of every, raising every uh, vessel. No, I learned from you. <laughs> I learned from you. <laughs> you know, that, I think that will I be think very we'll, do a, we'll do a webinar on, uh, you know, that, that uh, particular aspect of... Uh, yeah, let's do that. You know, we can do a combined one if you like, you know. The, 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 we'll do that. Imaging, imaging uh, on imaging. Uh, I'll uh, give you a call after uh, the. Uh, uh, yeah, no, no, no worry, no worry about that. But I think that will be very interesting for. Yeah, them. very interesting. Yeah, a lot of juniors can, will be benefited. Yeah, so you don't routinely do an MRI scan at all, and uh, for the MRI to me is uh, intracranial uh, involved. Only if anything intracranial, then I would like to do an MRI. And what is the reason for that? Why would you? That like is that? that is that is because I will be seeing uh, vessels uh, like, for example, uh, many uh, many trunks, and uh, uh, which part of the brain is involved, whether the cerebral peduncle is involved. All that cannot be seen in uh, uh, in a routine CT. So, which part of uh, the interpeduncular fossa is involved? Uh, how do I plan with respect to the PCOM and things like that? So. I think that is very useful when it goes intracranial. And what, uh, what's where, which part of the brain, where, where should I tackle this? And uh, because we have done a lot of cases where which is gone, uh, extra, most of it is extra dural intracranial. But there are very few JNAs which we have done which is gone intradural intracranial. And for that, I think, uh, I think the best would be an MRI. So what are your preferred sequences for uh, JNA? Uh, again, um, basically a T1 with contrast. I think that single one image, uh, which will give you a, a 
brilliant information along with an uh, mra with uh, um, i think t1 with contrast is going to give me the best, best. yeah yeah. Uh, yeah just to make it very simple not to put in too much of inputs onto the heads of uh, uh, the juniors i think one image for a particular a uh, tumor you should be having the best preference absolutely yeah so Otherwise, very confusing i mean it's okay for the experts you know they yeah. get different information yeah different sequences but for the juniors i think one investigation or one sequence should be put in yeah so even in a pituitary i always say look at just two images that is t2 and t1 with contrast these two will give you most of the information and then a little information from diffusion weight and all that you can gather later but as a junior uh, in mucor it's a uh, um, fat suppressed t2 with a t1 with contrast so most of them will boil down to one or two investigations at least the mind of the juniors will get trained to see that right great so thank you very much janki thank you professor sethi sir on a sunday uh, being with us it's a big honor Thank My you. pleasure, Jhanvi. Thank you. So we can open uh, it up. I, may I ask a question? May I oh, share, Jana? Hazam, how are you? How are you? Good morning. Thank you for the invitation. Can I see your uh, beautiful, uh, handsome face, my dear friend, from Egypt? I, 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 actually, you don't know where I am now. I'm in Saudi Arabia in my <laughs> room. <laughs> yes, okay. doing doing the Umrah, and I have just finished. I'm planning for some sleep, but you and uh, aroused me. <laughs> <laughs> I sent it to you on WhatsApp. Huh? <laughs> wonderful. Yes, yes, wonderful presentations yeah. and wonderful discussion. If I can catch few words uh, as uh, uh, like a, 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 a landmark for the for the presentations, I would say number one, uh, tamponade, suction, uh, bone drilling, uh, proper coordinations between the surgeon and the assistant, traction and counter traction. So these are keywords. Thank you very much for mentioning and highlighting them. Uh, the other thing is that would you find uh, uh, more difficult to handle a tumor lateral to the carotid or medial to the carotid? Uh, this is a point. And the other thing, personally, myself, uh, I, I agree with you about the very few cases of true intradural invasions, extremely few cases. And personally, I would never touch them anymore. So what's your comment? Okay, uh, so to answer your first question, uh, cavernous sinus, uh, uh, medial to carotid, lateral to carotid. In fact, in our yes. huge series of JNAs, we have seen only one case going medial to the carotid. So the reason is because the medial cavernous uh the the endosteal layer is like this and the carotid is hugging like this so generally jna respects the endosteal layer if the carotid is very close to the endosteal layer it's very difficult for it to actually squeeze between the endosteal layer and the carotid so going in the medial cavernous is sort of you know very rare and between the loops of the carotid it has to go between uh, through the uh, pituitary so through the because you have an endosteal layer on the pituitary also so going to the medial okay. cavernous is, sort of extremely rare the commonest okay. presentation we have seen in cavernous sinus is an anterolateral uh, involvement of the um, of the um, uh, the compartment of the cavernous sinus so medial okay, okay. Uh, cavernous is i think it's i've seen only one case of uh, medial cavernous but we have seen peters apex a lot of cases we have seen lateral we have seen uh, inferior so many varieties but Medial mm. cavernous is very rare. Very good. And the other thing which I the agree totally you with. What is your second question? Uh, the true intradural. Personally, I wouldn't touch them. Yeah. Actually, uh, we've done around seven cases. I think. Uh, hi, hi, guys. Uh, actually, uh, what we do is, uh, uh, I have posted that also in many of my uh, conferences. When I met you also, we have discussed that. Uh, we do a yes. coiling of the carotid and uh, the petrous carotid and the uh, uh, proximal end of the uh, clinoidal carotid and we resect the carotid along with the tumor. Okay. So after mm. a BOT, after a BOT, mm. the patient uh, passes the BOT and if the patient wants the tumor completely, most of these patients seventh revision, eighth revision, they just come and say, "Sir, I'm frustrated. Uh, just get mm. this tumor out." 
uh, i am ready uh, for anything any consequences then we do all that so basically in a primary case yes i would uh, follow whatever you say but if it's going to be multiple revisions and if it's going into the temporal lobe sometimes you have seen it going to the peduncles cerebral peduncles oh oh then, yeah yeah we have removed all those tumors and basically okay. all okay. that i i promise that in any cases or in any uh, situations where i face such a case i will definitely send them for for your hospital so don't oh, worry <laughs> as egypt is my second home my dear friend you know <laughs> oh yeah yeah so, just beneath the pyramids so just beside, in egypt. Be beside the pyramids you remember <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah 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 thank you, you very one, much well, see, i posted one uh, picture here see this is the picture uh, i don't know if you can see my background see th yeah, yeah. this is actually uh, intracranial jna see yeah, this is yeah, the jna okay. going from the nasal cavity in the paracranial space Huge. going intracranial that's a that's the uh, cover page of my book itself yeah and, yeah yeah uh, <laughs> remember the blood vessels so basically uh, yeah we uh, it's not that there are some papers which say that that cannot be an intra uh, dural uh, intracranial but i think both of us agree on that we have discussed in so many conferences before that uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, you have also seen it and i have also seen it i've seen it yes thank you very much janak ram and it's my pleasure thank you good luck and see you bye bye assalamu alaikum yeah. bye so is there any other question by anybody i think it's very interesting on a sunday after a long time uh, discussing and uh, meeting all my friends it's so nice anybody else has got a question dr sanjeev mahanti has raised his hand oh dr mohanti very very good friend of mine is like my brother my mentor my son actually joined ent because of him yeah can i uh, see your uh, sweet face dr mohanti and you can ask your question please unmute him uh, arsha hi yeah. hi janak how are you uh, wonderful hi i was there right Ye so yesterday the... yesterday i saw your uh, photograph and today i'm seeing you like see <laughs> oh the teacher in me and the student in me will always be there so <laughs> as we have interacted earlier it's all about a lifetime of learning so that's not going to change so uh, well my experience is not as uh, robust with the spectrum that you have already outlined but uh, uh, i have a fair share of revision cases which uh, have come to me and presently in the present setup you know there are a lot of uh, revisions and all of them they keep coming so just wanted to whether i missed it during your presentation or not i just wanted to know you said two revisions were done earlier before they came to you right or twice yeah, yeah. Okay. and uh, you haven't embolized today also i mean the time that you did uh, another two surgeries that you have done uh, with the revision the final one at your center no 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 two revisions were done elsewhere the first ha ah, that was yeah first i two understood were done that. elsewhere i don't know they i didn't have notes uh, oh i wanted to, i wanted to know whether you had an idea whether they were at least an attempt for a dsn embolization was done no, or no not notes. no no notes no notes at all would it be a good idea to at least map the vessels by doing a just a preliminary you know dsa along with the cct would it be helpful yeah i i showed you the uh, dsa yeah so uh, if you, it maybe is maybe you were not there during that period. no 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 i i saw that but uh, the whether the earlier notes said that they were embolized or not we have no idea about it no idea. so in such cases if there is a little uh, twigs from the uh, intel carotid system uh, which is in a revision case usually if it is embolized i'm saying i'm sure you have got many patients for revision which had already been embolized and operated and you they come to you in those cases usually you would have seen that the vidian and all of them would have been left behind and they are the main wet blood vessels how do you deal with them with the same tamponade uh, effect which you did for ascending pharyngeal which is little easier with the external carotid system than the internal so just wanted your uh, thoughts on yeah, that yeah very good question actually uh, as uh, professor mohanty uh, uh, has put that question i think it might not reach many of the juniors he was talking about embolization there are various kinds of embolization uh, one is uh, what is called the temporary embolization with gel foam particles and second is uh, uh, the coil embolization so this is just for the juniors so uh, if you do a coil embolization which we have seen a lot 
then what happens it's a permanent embolization so uh, it's actually a permanent uh, blocking of the vessel and then you have twigs coming from the internal carotid artery as he says very rightly puts it the vdn or the uh, basically i always believe that if you have not done embolization the best would be a tamponade effect so i would do the same thing in the cavernous sinus i would do the same thing in uh, uh, the vdn so i think packing it nicely pack 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 and wait and that is uh, as dr husam says uh, as observed very clearly i think that is a brilliant idea and then once you locate it you can do whatever you want you can cut rice coblet uh, clip it depends on whatever you want but of course the internal carotid artery as you say is a more difficult challenging uh, part of the surgery but uh, having said that uh, even that we actually use tamponade and then we actually co uh, coagulate with the kasam bipolar so when you are dissecting you can see the infralateral so there are only two arteries in the internal carotid artery generally which supplies it so in our experience number one is the infralateral trunk which has got two branches the inferior and the lateral uh, branch and you can actually uh, see in the dsa which which branch supplies it and you can actually uh, go and coagulate it uh, with a bipolar uh, or the meningoepithelial in the meningoepithelial a little difficult is the tentorial branch there are three branches of the meningoepithelial the inferior uh, uh, epithelial uh, and then uh, you have the meningeal and the tentorial the tentorial branch comes from behind and that is a little difficult i have seen uh, uh, i have presented also one case where the tentorial branch was left behind i didn't do anything because it is coming from behind and you have to go through the brain to do that and that is a little difficult uh, when you get it as you see, rightly pointed out internal carotid is going to be a difficult uh, task and if you have that unless you have experience like uh, you know senior surgeons like mohanty sir or uh, any other center it's uh, it's better to uh, go for radiotherapy or uh, alternate modalities of treatment rather than to go on venture and uh, try to pluck it and cut the carotid a uh, one point on flutamide since the that was a point of discussion you know there was a, a very nice paper from aims daily they tried about 15 years back but in the results as you said is very 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 iffy and it really doesn't work much except adding a little more fibrosis to it which anyway with radiotherapy happens and it's more dangerous for the surgeon if at all the patient lands after a few years with the same kind of therapy which uh, you will not get the planes around of course you are different you will create planes i mean for me i'll uh, probably is the same with everybody actually more important thing is more than the planes the arteries become a little friable so exactly. uh, 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 we have seen one case of carotid rupture because of radiotherapy the problem is Uh, the patient had radiotherapy uh, several i think one time and then several surgeries came back here and when i was dealing with the cavernous sinus the carotid was like you know fragile and gave way so radiotherapy you should always think about uh, the fragility of the vessels no the flutamide uh, therapy was uh, stemming from the fact that they thought is androgen dependent and all that so that is how it was anti uh, but it really did. Uh, work out on in our uh, era we used to give danazol you know yes. uh, yeah, yeah that is hey, don't say our era we are not that uh, you know <laughs> no, sorry in my era <laughs> i'm just joking and just to put a case in a point a small little uh, you know experience of mine recently about uh, it was about 8 or 9 months back uh, when a revision uh, kind of a jna came which already had a few surgeries earlier believe me i did a dsa and uh, with the ct angio basically and uh, the vidian artery was so much more thicker than the ascending pharyngeal which is generally will be little thick much thicker than the vidian so that is why this question i asked so yeah yeah, yeah. very right. vidian actually vidian artery sometimes becomes very big and uh, that's difficult to control uh, to me i think the vidian artery the one good thing about the vidian artery it runs through a canal So, what happens is that once you uh, use the diamond bar and nicely uh, drill the canal yeah. even then sometimes it bleeds so i put the coblation on that uh, um, the yellow what is that the uh, uh, ablation mode and nicely uh, screw that uh, this one so that's that's the way i do it and uh, do you use fibrillar in some cases at the of bed course. in, in cavernous sinus yes 
I'm not. So I just want to mention two things. Uh, when you use uh, packing in the cavernous sinus, um, number one is I can use fibrillar uh, or I can use uh, Surgicel gel foam, uh, Flow Seal, Surgi Flow, everything. But the thing is, we have seen in I think uh, three cases uh, a temporary third nerve palsy. So um, uh, I have documented this also and. Um, uh, maybe when I write the next edition of the book, I can write all this. So three cases, all the three cases recovered after six months. So uh, so be careful when you pack. Don't pack it very tight. Probably, these... probably when the packing is at the annulus tendons communis, maybe the pressure there probably would uh, be the reason why there is a temperature. Very probably. Can... The super orbital fissure area. So. Anyway, thanks, uh, Janki. Thank you, Dr. Professor Mohanty, and thank you for yesterday. Uh, uh, you know, um, it's always, always a pleasure when I see uh, teachers like you, and you no, inspire no, yeah. students, and uh, you create uh, the, uh, um, you know, inspiring. No, no. Satya is always a uh, protege, and uh, whether you uh, bless or not, I'm definitely going to bless. So that's okay, not a thank problem. You. Thank you. Thank you so much. Slices. Thanks. Anybody else has got any questions? Nobody else? Asha? Hello. Asha? Hello. Sir, good afternoon, sir. Who is that? Good afternoon, sir. I'm love here. Dr. Love here. Doctor? Love. Hi, love. How are you, man? Fine, sir. How are you, sir? Oh, my love. My sweetheart. On sir. Valentine's Day. Yeah, good morning, sir. <laughs> yeah, uh, tell me, tell me. Sir, uh, regarding the tempo knot you are using. Yes. The packing. So you use saline or it will be your uh, uh, xylocaine or adrenaline or it's a simple saline? Just saline, boss. Nothing else. Saline. Nothing else. And sir, regarding the flutomide dose. So this, do you give pre-op, post-op or any, any? I dose? generally don't give flutomide, boss. Seriously. <laughs> okay. I generally don't give. Okay. My my clear idea is, if I can operate on a case, why should I resort to some uh, other means, modalities? So I am a true surgeon. I want to remove it as far as possible. If I leave it in a particular instance on the carotid, where the usually that's where I leave it, where the patient is not not given consent for removal, not given consent for removal. Then I will think about any other thing, which is very rare in our practice. Generally, we remove. Okay, sir. It's a great presentation, sir. <laughs> Always a pleasure, love. Always a pleasure. Sir. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Love. Uh, Dr. AKJ, I can see his hand rise. Uh, Dr. AKJ. Hello. Hello. Hi, sir. Uh, good afternoon, sir. I am Dr. Anil Jain from Bhopal. Oh, hi, Dr. Anil Jain. How are you? Uh, I am fine. Thank you, sir, for a nice presentation, sir. Thank you. Uh, we are religiously following your surgical steps and everything. Thank you. Uh, I have one question. Sir, I have one query. Yeah, tell me. Sir, sir, actually, we have a patient with a huge jugular valve tumor. What? You have so, jugular valve tumor. Yeah. So uh, we are not able to manage the patient, and we wish to send it to you. Is it possible? Sure, sure. Why not? Why not? May <laughs> so, I coordinate you or someone? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I can uh, come. Uh, this is Doctor uh, Yogendra. He is from uh, you know uh, Doctor uh, Yogendra is from uh, Jaipur. He has joined us as a fellow. Uh, you can tell him okay, our number, your number. Yeah, sir, you can send him. Okay, give, uh, sir, note my number. Sure, just a moment. Just a moment. Yes, please. Yes, sir. 92143. 92143. 14143. 14143. Yes, sir. You gave it to Yes, sir. I'll send all the details to you. Okay, sir. Sure. Actually, I'm having, sir, your number also. We are in touch in AI group also. 
Okay, okay, okay. He is a Yogendra to... from uh, Jaipur, and he has uh, joined for the past two months. Is here. Okay, so I did not want to disturb you directly. No problem, sir. No problem. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks a lot, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you. So, anybody, Sampurna? Yeah, Dr. Sampurna Ghosh. I think she's from Hyderabad. Yeah, I met her. Hi, Sampurna. How are you? You have to unmute yourself. Yeah. Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon, young, dynamic, calvary surgeon. <laughs> Not <laughs> yet, sir. You need to allow me to come to you and learn, sir. But but the way you uh, described the plan that was really really excellent. Like, going back each time. Uh, one second, uh, Harsha. There's somebody else who is talking, man. Try to uh, uh, mute everybody. Yeah, Sampurna, carry on. So the plan you have explained very nicely. First time I understood the plan uh, in that way. Usually people show the surgery. And I have just uh, two questions that what are the instruments you would say mandatory to have while doing JNA? Like normally debrider coblation we all have. Uh, maybe uh, we, I also use the skull base drill which goes with the M5 hand piece. And uh, what about the clips? Those clips are mandatory or is there any other substitute? I think you should have clips, boss. If you're doing proper skull base, it's better you have clips. It's available clips. in skull okay. stores. Right. And, uh, number one. Number two, you should have a carotid Doppler. Carotid Doppler. Okay. Because uh, when you're dealing with JNAs involving the carotid, you should have a Doppler to map the carotid. Or okay. else it's sometimes dangerous. So apart from your regular uh, instruments for FES, I have also given a set. Uh, you can uh, inquire Santos Surgicals. Oh, yeah. A JNA set. JNA set. Oh, uh, nice. Me, and you can uh, get that. The lux and all will be different. Uh, it's a handle lux. Then a JNA holder and all this stuff. Okay. So you can ask some questions. Okay. And uh, sir, uh, what is your indication for embolization? Already I heard about the discussion with other seniors about, but what is your take home message for us? That he is a, a, beginner, a beginner who has got a good radiologist by him who can uh, rely on that radiologist. Better to go with embolization. Okay. okay. Don't take the chance. But as you proceed on to your. Uh, uh, maybe 50th, 60th case, something like that. Try to do it without embolization because you're reducing cost for the patient. Okay. And it's not necessary at all. You can actually see the vessel and uh, clip it. But okay. you have to come to that level of surgical expertise where you can map that vessel, clip it. For that, it will take a little time. But till then, go with embolization. But sometimes what happens if you're not having a good uh, uh, radiologist, even if there's embolization, there's a lot of bleeding. Right. So that is and something. The last that... question is sir, not related to JNA, it's related to swanoma. Like for JNA, I understood your uh, opinion about radiotherapy. You are not very keen on that. Uh, what about the swanoma? Because uh, the intracranial part, which there was a case where I couldn't. What swanoma? The... You're talking about uh, vagal nerve swanoma or glossopharyngeal nerve swanoma, which is going through the foramen intracranial part. So uh, is, that the, is there the, it's better to go for the radiotherapy immediately see, after surgery? I'll tell you what, as a surgeon, see, I, I can tell you a very nice incident. I went to uh, Pakistan. Mm -hmm. Okay, I went to Pakistan. Uh, I had a very big congress, neurosurgical con congress. Uh, I was invited by Professor Satar. Satar is a very big neurosurgeon who has a LINAC and all this stuff. So uh, I gave a lecture saying that no benign tumor should be subjected to Kava knife. This was my conclusion. Mm -hmm. Next, immediately after that, there was one gentleman who came in and he had gunmen on both sides he came and landed in a helicopter, helipad, and then he came in. I was wondering who is that? The person who has invented Dhamma knife. <laughs> okay. <laughs> it was so embarrassing for me. I can't forget that conference because my conclusion was never a Dhamma knife for a, a benign tumor. And then this person who invented, he is a big don actually who flew with the helipad, came inside and he said, my God, the history of Gamma Knife, how he invented and things like that. I had goosebumps. From then onwards, I just kept my mouth shut. I never said no Gamma Knife at all. So you want me to uh, get into a trap? You tell me. 
No, he, nobody <laughs> like that is here, sir. It's only for us. <laughs> no, no, I'm just joking. But uh, honestly speaking, I'm not a gamma knife person. Uh, if you can excise a tumor as a surgeon, it's the best. I mean, if, if you can't, and if you feel that the morbidity might be heavy, then going for uh, alternate modalities of treatment. Okay. Okay. Thank you, sir. Thank you. So, are you going to do any cadaver dissection for? Scar yeah, we'll be starting all that very shortly. Now, uh, I think uh, from next month onwards, I'll become very active. Every week, we'll be doing something. So stay tuned. You will be seeing a lot of. I think Dr. Character. Sri Harsha will update that in Hyderabad. Yeah, yeah. Harsha is there. Harsha, the big Harsha is there. Yes, thanks to him that we are getting these links for him. Exactly. Thank exactly. you so much, sir. I should thank, thank Harsha for that. Yeah. yeah. Bye, sir. Thank you. Bye, bye. So anybody else? I think uh, yeah, it's uh, it was a very nice uh, workshop and uh, webinar with a lot of people attending. I do. Uh, is there anybody? Nageshwar Rao. Hi, my dear brother. I think it's left. Okay, Harsha. I think if we are done. Hello, Asha. Sir. Yeah, can we call it a day? Yes, sir. Thank you very much uh, to all of you. It was a pleasure and uh, honor for us uh, uh, to be again back on the um, web platform. And it was a, a wonderful interaction with all the uh, participants. We had a lot of people from abroad as well. And my mentor, teacher, uh, Professor Sethi was there. I am so honored. Thank you very much. Uh, God bless you all and uh, have a nice day. Thank you.